So this is the second part of a two-part series where we're talking about race and we're talking about how our understanding and appreciation of each other and our differences and how we serve the homeless community. In the first episode, we covered some of our questions like who we are, and so we're going to just pick up from, from where we left off and continue to talk about what we can do to love each other well. Who is our calling? What does our calling do to help the homeless? The nonprofit. We care our with calling, dignity. Our calling. Can't help but think about the definition of Christian. We connect our with calling. intentionality. Our calling. Our calling. It's to our calling. We build community with our calling. integrity. Our calling. This is our calling in our podcast, A Word on the Streets about homelessness. You know, we talked about school and government as well and the blame there, but that's all just based on whoever gets elected, right? Yeah. And so if you're talking about the inability to vote because of poll tax, because yeah. of Jim Crow laws, or the lack of desire to vote because you don't think it's going to matter anyway, right? Then we have people in power, be it local ele elections or national elections, who are making decisions for us that will continue to perpetuate their power, exactly. whatever that is. Absolutely. So how do you guys see the fault on school or government related to this? I think with school, um, it, I, and I know I, I keep saying this, it's just that they took so many programs away from the South um, that they don't get to do anymore. Like we used to have field trips going to the symphony, going to the orchestra. They don't do that because of funding. Um, and so, you know, you have... Uh, kids that don't get exposure to all of the arts that's just here in yeah. Dallas um, that they could see and, you know, get exposure to. And that may make them the next, you know, person, you know, the next Maya Angelou because they went to a poet conference. You know, we don't do that anymore. We don't expose them. And it's because they don't have the funds and the lack of parenting on that side of town. They're yeah. not they're just not getting the exposure. And so education used to be that exposure. Um, I remember in the summertime, you know, we had the rec center. And so the rec center, the local rec center for the summer was the daycare because they had every activity going on. They had arts and crafts. You could go play basketball. They had people there and they served lunch. And so most of the neighborhood was there at the local rec center, but they were also being exposed because people were you know, teaching them different arts and crafts and teaching them how to play basketball and, and all that. And you and now you don't even hear about it. Um, the Boys and Girls Club, you barely even hear that mentioned anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's like, what do those kids on that side of town for education wise? And then also, let's just talk about, you know, the when COVID hit, COVID exposed the south side of Dallas on how many people didn't even have internet in their homes. Mm, yeah. You would have been shocked. I was shocked on how many people didn't have a computer and didn't have internet. Yeah, when kids are supposed to do school online. When they're supposed to do school online. And here is something that I took for granted because I had internet and I had computers and I just assumed every household had at least one, but they didn't. Mm. No internet, no nothing. Um, and so they didn't have that problem in the north side. Well, South Dallas doesn't even have, you know, let's be honest. They don't even have gro good grocery stores. They don't have stores. good grocery yeah. stores. So our building here mm -hmm. is right across I-30. I mean, we can throw a football to hit it. I, you could throw a football. I could that far. But there's a, there's a road there, I-30, and so we're technically just on the edge of the south of Dallas, just across downtown. When we moved into this building, there was no Internet anywhere in this area. We were one of the Dallas Morning News charities, and the Dallas Morning News would not deliver a paper to us. Right. We would stay late at work and want to order a pizza. Mm -hmm. None of the pizza delivery places in Deep Ellum, that's like three minutes away, they go over there. wouldn't <laughs> deliver here. Right? They're like, you can come to us, we won't deliver there. Yeah. And to me, it's just crazy, the disparity yeah. in the north and south. And so we can complain. It took them forever to get fiber over here or something. But when you think about the disparity for communities, families, children— where do you go for a good daycare? Where do you go for a good pizza? Where do you go? You talk about lack of good restaurants and mm -hmm. where you live. You yeah, because on, on the south side of sound, you know what's over there? Fast food. Yeah. That's, that's primarily, we probably have one good restaurant 
um, Papa Do's and it's so crowded it's like Club Papa Do's you can't get in because that's everybody <laughs> trying to get over there uh, yeah. so and it's expensive and it's expensive so you know like um, me I mostly eat north <laughs> because that's where all the restaurants are um, but yeah on that side of town like fast food and so what does fast food do health so you you think about another thing. Mm. If you if a mom all she got is to go to McDonald's and that's what she can afford and that's what she's gonna feed her kids every day because she have worked all day long. She got off work. She tired. She trying to you know uh, get in, get them ready for school, get you know check their homework because half of them probably don't even do their homework because it's late. Whatever the case, but that's all that's on that side of town. Yeah, that's it. Um, and so you know it's like where do you take them? Or where do you teach them how to go in a restaurant and sit down? Because I remember we learned how to go sit down. And I take my grandkids to go sit down, learn how to order your own food. Um, but it's nothing over there. Yeah, yeah. I, I know we're probably getting shorter on time. I wanted to kind of circle back on the school piece. So I was amazed uh, when my oldest daughter went to high school, we lived in, uh, in, in Oak Park. So she went to Oak Park River Forest High School there in Chicago. And um, I was amazed that it was actually, it, it was two schools in one building. And the school had a failing rating. But on the other side of the campus, it was exemplary. And I said, how, how is this possible? And it's because all of the honor classes, all of the, uh, my daughter was taking Latin, they had French, they had, but the deal was you, you had to have a certain qualification to get in, you, had, you were tested, but not all of the students knew about it. So maybe these there's some students over here that could get there, but they don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. And so it was just amazing to me that really you had Little Rock in one building. Mm -hmm. So you got a segregated school system in the same building. And I was like, this is crazy. Yeah. Interesting. And so I think because of the disparity of education, our kids are not equipped for the new millennium. We are no longer the industrial nation. If you don't know anything about service, computers, technology, how to work on a team, how to, how to think, how to, if, these are critical skills that are learned through rigor. And if you don't learn that, you're not ready. And so most you, you, McDonald's is not going to get it. $16 an hour is not going to get it. Not when a loft is $1,700. That's a studio, by the way. It's $1,700. And so now all of a sudden, you, you, you can't make a fair wage, which means I don't have a decent place to live. And, my, my, and with, with, our, with our parents' generation and grandparents' generation, I mean, they had factors in their own day that was probably similar to that or even worse than that. But one of the things that, like Rodney mentioned, that my father just would not take, he would just not take no for an answer. It was like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to quit. It's going to be hard. But what I'm not going to do is resort to this life of crime either. I'm going to, he retired from the military, uh, honorable, honorable discharge, retired from the military, mass, retired master sergeant of the military, my late father, and used those skills that he gained in the military, went to trade school, mm -hmm. and said, "I, you know, I'm gonna raise family, get married, raise a family in that order. I'm gonna get married, and then have children. That's a whole, that's a whole another conversation that we can have. I mean, seriously, that we need to have with our, not just our people, but it doesn't just, we're not unique to that. But, you know, the whole single mom parent 
epidemic, right? But he was going to do that, and he was going to use his skills. He he was a self he was a self self employed entrepreneur. Started his own business, working you know um, appliance and refrigeration service. He knew that that everybody's going to need a refrigerator. Everybody's going to need an AC. And he said he strategically used his brain, used his mind and said, I, you know, I may not be able to get into college, you know, X, Y, and Z. Or I may be deprived of certain things, but nobody can deprive me of, of this skill set. And so he put it to work. A family of nine. My, my parents raised a family of nine kids mm. in, that day and, in that day and time, in that era, with all of those restrictions, with all of that stuff coming out of you know, in, in the civil rights era, coming out of all of that, he worked his tail off and did not allow us to to make excuses and was like, you're going to go to school. Even when we went to school in, in subpar schools compared to uh, in Austin, compared to North Austin, right, um, compared to the other schools, Westlake and the whole nine, he was like, you're going to go to school and you're going to give it your best. Mm-hmm. And I know you may not have all of what this other school district has, but you can still learn something. And so that it, for, for us, it's, yes, hold the schools accountable. They need to do their thing. But at the, at also at the end of the day, right, it's like what's happening in the home? What's happening in the home? And even with our, our friends in our homeless community. And, and, uh, yeah, it's like what's happening in the home? And I know we're dealing with grown men and grown women, but that's where I think our pride comes from and I, or our sense of, of uh, not, I don't say toughness. Maybe toughness is a good word to say it. Directness. Maybe it's that we have a. No, I think we see it differently because we. That's our. That, that's our uncle or our brother's right. sister. I have two un- yeah, yeah, uncles yeah. that were homeless. And I got a nephew right now. Homeless. That are calling his help. Yeah, and our calling helped my oldest uncle, and so he is now with uh, his sister. He had he went off and uh, he ended up having cancer, and actually had stage four cancer and. They didn't expect him to live, but I think our calling came at a time where he was ready to change. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I, you know, when we see them walk in the door, we're seeing ourselves. So it's That's different right. for yeah. us versus, you know, I, you know, you, my cousin, when you see him walk in the door, it's a different feel. That's my relative. That could be my uncle. That could be my cousin. That could be my nephew. That could be my grandfather. And so when we see that, it, it it does bring up something different in us because we're just going back to how we were raised. Like, why are you in here acting like that? You know better. Because that's what I hear in my head. Now, you know better. You know not to act like that. You know you know how to act in front of people. And then I have to stop and think, do they really? No, because they didn't get the same parenting that I got. Yeah, I think yeah. there's such a disconnect there in the different experience of someone that's not homeless right? None of us are, home, are experiencing homelessness, but the different experience that we look at it through our different eyes. So I would say from, from my perspective as a, as a white man, you know, when, when many of my friends come here to serve, they think of this as a mission field, right? You go yeah. to a mission trip. What do you do when you go to a mission trip, right? You get ready because you're going to go to a different area of town. You're going to see people that don't look like you, You're going to talk to people that don't talk like you. You're going to try to be the hands and feet of Christ. And when you're done, you go back home and you've left that mission field and return back to your, you know, wherever that is. However, Tori, when you show up to work and I have talked to the pastors of your churches and and friends and, 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 you know, other people in this community, in the black community, that when they show up down here, it's not a mission field. No. This oh. is family. This is family. This is home. That's your uncle. That's my uncle. That's your brother. Yeah. And so the difference of of serving this community when you have a relationship, you, that's your cousin. That's your nephew. That's right. Right? That's someone you went to high school with. That's right. Now, yes, I've seen people that I know, and I have family members that have mm-hmm. experienced homelessness as well. However, it's a completely different experience when I when 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 I walk onto this campus than when you walk on this campus and we need to appreciate the differences between them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, particularly when we have our Saturday group who comes uh, with us, one of the things that I ask them to do is, is just know at the end of the day, I'm gonna ask you, what did you see? Mm-hmm. What did you see? 
and and we all every every time we come up here and you know they tell me well you know I feel so good about serving I, and I'm like that's great it's wonderful but did you ever wonder why there were so many black people down there in a city I said when you look to the north you see these cranes that's money when you look to the south you don't see you see desolation have you ever thought about that? And, there, and you could see the puzzled look on their face. Those are the things we want people to walk away. We want them to wonder why are things the way they are? And what can I do to fix it? In the same way for us, and I'm talking about the African-American community, we turn a blind eye to our people on the streets. So, mm-hmm. like, you don't get app reports on the south side of town. Probably hardly ever. Mm-hmm. Because when we drive down the street, we're like, oh, now where is his family at? He knows he don't need to be out here doing that. So we have a whole different perspective mm-hmm. of homelessness. And until I got here, it wasn't, I was like, there's a lot of homeless people that look like me. Um, but I think working here helps me get both sides, both yeah, in. Absolutely. And so my, what I would normally say has changed. Because now I'm looking at that person and saying, what kind of trauma did they have? Was there some mental issues? Um, Where I never would have asked those questions before. Um, You know, before I would have just been like, why are you homeless and out here? And I know you got a family somewhere that's looking for you. Um, So I think it's I think it's good for both cultures. It helps us to be in reality of that. We have a broken people. And then what can we do about it? And, stop, you know, I don't want it to always be like, okay, what can the people from the north do? No, it has to be us, too. Mm-hmm. Like, we have to be doing something, too. And so that's one of the things that kind of, when I got here, that I'm just shocked about is that we don't have a lot of African-American churches or businesses that come that support when 80% of the people look just like them. Mm-hmm. Exactly like them. And so that's shocking to me. And I, I'm still trying to figure out what's the button to click where it changes to everybody needs to be involved to correct this problem. And I feel in my role, right, are they not coming because of me? Are they not coming because it, the organization is not led by somebody that looks like them? Uh, that probably is true. I don't know. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just to be honest, I'm gonna say, right? Yeah, I'm going to say it's probably I mean, what, true. I mean, I've sat across the table from the pastors of the largest black churches uh-huh. in North Texas, and I've asked those questions, right? And and they baffle at some of the same responses. Would would they be more willing to come and serve? I mean, so you guys make up half of our senior leadership team, right? You are CFO, your director of programs, your director of operations. There's a few more folks on the team. You guys are in senior leadership positions. What What would it look like? But then we have other partner agencies who have, you know, African-American men and women in senior leadership positions, and they have the same challenges. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So I, I, I don't know what I, the answer is. I don't know what the answer is, and I'm still working on it. I may write a paper on it. I don't know. But well, uh, no, I'm, we would talk. I think some of it is true. You know, there is, yes. you know, well, we've got this white guy who's leading this organization. He's the face of it. You know, I don't know, I don't know if we want to be a part of that. Sorry. But also, too, when I think I think it, it can be deeper. Yeah. It can be deeper. And this is what I mean by that. When I left the east side of San Antonio in 1983... I vowed to never go back. Mm -hmm. I made it out. I'm gone. I got out. Y'all can get out. Wrong attitude. It's just wrong, Mm -hmm. man. It's wrong. It's the wrong attitude. And I think I'm not the only one that 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 had that attitude. But I think the more you see things that are not changing and getting worse. You're like, wait a minute. The the Lord did not allow me to get exposed to things. He did not allow me to get a few resources. That's not for me. That's for me to go back and reach back and help some other people come up. And I think it takes an epiphany to get there. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we, we have two more questions we need to answer. And so I want, want us to think about summary statements for these two questions. And I'm going to tell you what they are first. And I want you to think about your answers and then we'll talk about them. Okay. The first one is what can churches and individuals do? I want you to just think about that. What would your answer be? What would you say in general? Okay. The second question is if you could reduce your, your conversation to just the, you know, if you said, Hey, look, this, I'm going to speak to the white community and this is what, this is what I want to say to the white community. And then what would you say to the black community? If you could personify that as just one person, what would you say to the white community? What would you say to the black community? And just summarize that statement from all of our different perspectives. But let's start off with what can churches and individuals do? In relationship to homelessness? Yes, and in relation to serving the homeless community. Our goal here is to help people walk Mm -hmm. with Jesus and get off the streets, right? So there's a lot of racial disparity that we've discussed. What can we do today, maybe just in general for society, right? Your daughters, my kids, right? But also just what can we do in in this particular issue? Okay, I'll, I'll go first. I think the thing that I love about what we do is, is that we say we are a discipleship ministry. And I think when churches come down here, they should be in a discipleship learning posture. So, so we're, we're going down there to learn how to disciple, engage, homeless individual individuals in our sphere of influence. I think that should be the mentality. I'm, I'm talking about my church now. I'm not talking about anybody else's church. I met with my church in July, and I, and I shared with them that the plan for homelessness is not to call our calling and say, hey, we got a homeless guy here on the steps of the church. Can y'all come get him? I said, that's not the plan. I said, that's not a plan. The plan should be, let's go down there and learn how we're going to engage our homeless friends in this area and what we should do. That should be the plan. Mm. And so I think the only way that happens is by people coming down here and being a learner. That would be my thought. I think for me, uh, living in Oak Cliff, uh, so I think the churches on that side, A, they need to recognize that there is homelessness over there. And and they need to learn what that definition truly means. Um, And then they also need to come volunteer and see, like Lara said, how can I go back and take this to the community that I'm in? and partner with our calling to get the resources that they need um, to take it back to their community. I think OCBF did a great start job. They had us over there um, because they're recognizing that homelessness is everywhere. It's Mm -hmm. not just downtown, it's everywhere now. Um, And so I think for the black church, we've just gotta be more involved and that needs to be on our agenda. Just like we have things on our agenda for the year, homelessness needs to be a part of that every year. Yeah, I would agree. Um, just exposing themselves to how we do ministry, I think, is a good step to the homeless. Um, and just understanding, man, this is really not about anybody's individual kingdom or corner of the market and whose name is on this thing and whose face is out front. Like, there are people and among those people, the largest segment of those people look like us who are homeless. And do we care enough to get engaged at whatever level and want to encourage the church and challenge the church to say, you need to engage and understand that I think, yes, it's good for you to put together some food boxes or non-perishable stuff or whatever, but that stuff doesn't work with our homeless friends. Like, they don't have places to cook anything. They don't, they don't have places to microwave 
anything, right? And yes, you know, you can get some hot meals and I mean, yeah, but homelessness goes deeper than that. And that's not coming from an arrogant place. Those are things that I learned when I came to work here mm-hmm. uh, that I learned even more. Um, that there's a lot of factors, it's a lot of complexity to homelessness. And it'll be good just to expose yourself to see that and to see why ministries like ourselves or ministry like ourselves is, is important. That yes, you can do things as a church, and we encourage churches to do that, but it's so much more complex that you cannot do this by yourself. You can't. We, we don't do this by ourselves. We, we're in a continuum of care. In our city, we have other organizations, other agencies we partner with that handle some of the specialties and some of the issues that we don't handle. And they so do we need amazing each other. work, and they yes. do amazing work. You know, absolutely, yeah. it's it's the whole body, it's the whole it's community, absolutely. and it's it's amazing to see that. You know, we're not here to help our homeless friends be just fat, happy, and homeless. Right, right. We're we're here to help them get off the streets. Right? Absolutely. And for years, for years, you know, we we were part of a homeless ministry at a church, going out and feeding the homeless, feeding the homeless, feeding the homeless. Well, great, we just feed people and leave trash all over the streets. We were doing that, but how do we actually help people do two things: walk with Jesus and get off the streets? Yeah. Um, now, what can we do? I have I have an idea, but it doesn't have anything to do with homelessness. And then I want to talk about you know our statements we would make. You know, Rodney, you and I were part of a group a few years ago. It was uh, five black men and four white men, and mm-hmm. we spent a year together just learning and building relationships and connectivity with each other. I think one of the things we can do racially to get to know someone is you need to have someone that doesn't look like you. I'm not talking about a black friend. I'm not talking about a black cup of coffee, you know, with that black friend. You need to have someone that doesn't look like you sitting at your dinner table in your home. Mm -hmm. And that's on both sides of the table. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We really need to do that. I mean, the times when, you know, Rodney, I've known you for over 20 years, but, you know, the times that Carolyn and I have been over to your house with Billy and you and Mm -hmm. celebrate your daughters when they graduated high school and Mm -hmm. college and, and, you know, now you guys have come over to our house. And, you know, the times when we've spent time together outside of the office has been really, really precious because I'll be honest with you, I did not grow up with a lot of friends that didn't look like me. Um, And my life is so much richer and so much more beautiful and whole because of that. You, you, you are some of the most brilliant people I know, period. You also happen to be African-Americans and that culture pours into that and pours into my life and makes me a better person. You just are, you're some of my most close, precious people to me. And Carolyn would say the same thing. I mean, our lives are so much richer because of having you. And I think racially, one thing we can do is not talk and not just, you know, try to, you know, poke uh, somebody that's a little bit different than us, but actually break bread in your home, invite someone to your home across the table with your kids, right? And experience relational life together, right? Mm -hmm. So the last question is if we were to reduce the entire community, black and white, and we're gonna have a statement, what would you say to the black community? And what would you say to the white community? So I would say to the black community, it is time for us to step up and stop talking and actually do the work that is required that Jesus Christ has put on our heart um, to make our community better, to make um, the world better, and just to teach our children that, you know, it doesn't matter what color you are. Uh, We're all the same in Jesus Christ's eyes. And then for the white community, I would just challenge the white community, um, you said it best, really get to know somebody else that is not the same color as you because it's very enriching, it's very enlightening. Um, I have a friend here at OC that nobody would think we were friends, but he called me yesterday from Oklahoma, harassing me the whole way, and he is not my skin color. And I told him, if you call me one more time, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but I'm waiting for him because he says when it gets cool, he's going to invite me out and mm-hmm. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to eat some brisket or whatever he puts on the smoke grill. So I think that's the challenge. Uh, if you're in the white community, get to know somebody else that's not your race. Mm-hmm. 
because yeah. it is very enriching and very enlightening, and you can learn a lot from each other. Uh, one of the things I know about Dallas is Dallas is a very consumer-driven town. We don't have very much natural beauty here, so we either drive it or wear it. Um, <laughs> I, I would I would say stop being a consumer and let's get down to work. And I think that's on both sides. I think I I, I just think, man, this place is just driven. I mean, I want to go out to eat on the weekends. It's, it's, it's a, we don't want to we we want to consume. And I think God, uh, we should not be reduced to just being a consumer. And I think that's on both ends. Yeah, I would say to the the black community to our people. I mean, there's a lot to say, but I'll say, yes, there are legitimate maybe barriers that we run up against systemically, right? Maybe not as widespread, obviously, as it was with our parents and grandparents. We may run into remnants of it here and there, depending on who's in charge, right, and who's running the show, and who's pulling the strings. But we still have the God-given ability to make our own choices. Hmm. And we can either choose to respond positively to adversity and opposition and whatnot, hmm. or we can choose to respond negatively to it. We may not be able to control all of the circumstances that surround us, but we can we can control how we're going to respond to it and what we're going to do about it. Um, I live in a predominantly black community, and when I look out and I'm when I drive up to McDonald's or do I drive up, you know, and I see people at you know workers there, it's not the man that's causing somebody to give me bad customer service and, 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 it's, and it's causing me to maybe not want to come back and patronize your business, the man has nothing to do with that. You know who has who's responsible for that interaction in that moment? It's you. It's me. No, nobody is, we're not discounting the, the societal, you know, communal, whatever, collective things, realities that we have to deal with. But man, I have to pull, we have to pull back on our, on our ancestors and be like, if they can make it through this with God's help and they had all of these things against them, man, with God's help, we can do the same. And not to use it as an excuse or to keep pointing fingers out and blaming everything and everyone else. Not that we do that, but that tends to sometimes happen. But they just realize the dignity that we have as a people, that we are created in God's image, just like everybody else. We have a will and Abilities just like everybody else. And yes, we have things that happen to us that we didn't cause. But man, the last time I checked, God can redeem that stuff, man. He can he could he can cause bring beauty out of ashes. And you know, and so we just want to, and I would say that to the black community. To the white community, um, man, man, I, I, I would say just for some of and not that they do this, but don't put on the savior complex. Right. So it's like you're not coming down here to save the those poor black people. Right. Or whatever the case may be like. And not that, again, that that's everybody's thought, not that people think that, but you can function that way, too. Even if you don't necessarily have have that type of mentality, you can function in that way inadvertently. Right. Um, but to come down here, realize and with anybody that you engage with, anybody that's different than you, ethnically different than you. That's a person, man, that has dignity and that has a rich life and culture that they are a part of and that it's worth getting to know that particular individual and know that you just don't bring something to the table. They bring something to the table, right? That we bring something to the table, right? I'll say this as a, as a last thing for me, um, and, and, and this may end up being another podcast. I don't know, man, how you want to handle this, but I don't want to open up a... It's probably going to open up another can of worms, but it is interesting to me that when it comes to diversity, ethnic diversity in the church, that in some cases, that diversity only works one way, where you'll have, 
you you're good to invite black folk into your church, but that not necessarily go the other way, right? You you want you want black people part of your church, and sit under your leadership, but it doesn't go the opposite way. And why is that, right? Not just in the church, but just in life. Um, and so I would just encourage the white communities, man, listen, don't white flight all the time. Just because black folk and brown folk move in your community, um, you know, stay there, build relationships, embrace the richness of that. Um, you go to certain places, man, there's a richness. And my wife is from New York. There's a richness in, in New York, man, in terms of a melting pot. You know, all these ethnicities coming together and these cultures coming together that all of us miss out on when we just are when we're just mono, you know, in terms of our demographic. Whether it's black community or white community, there's a richness when you come together. So well, however you can do that, you may not be able to move to a different community, but just put yourself in places and in spaces, man, where you can engage with people who look differently than you and, and come across a different track than you and raise differently than you. I think that'll enrich your life. So if I had to give a statement Right, same question to the black community and the white community. I guess first to the black community, w and I mean this wholeheartedly, I'm sorry. I really am. Because I contributed to all the challenges we've talked to today. And my family did for generations. Contributed. And I own that. And I'm not here out of some white guilt, but I am owning my part in this. And I wish there was some God-given way to go back and change things. I can't. It's the world we are in. I mm -hmm. think there's things we can do today going forward, mm -hmm. but I own this and I'm so sorry. I'm also really proud to work with each of you and love watching the Lord use you with your unique gifts you know, you have such unique gifts. Each one of you are, are so different. And when you use those gifts, it is nothing short of worship. And I love watching mm -hmm. you worship in the way that God has gifted you to, to love and to reach this community in beautiful ways. And, and I've said this statement I'm about to say uh, to many men and women in black churches and, and when I've spoken at churches and even to senior leadership. And I don't, I don't know another way to say this, but we need more black men and women to come down here and serve. I do. We need more people that look like you to put their arms around and embrace our brothers and sisters on the street that look like you mm -hmm. and teach them what it looks like to follow Christ from your perspective and your cultural mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. We just need that. Agreed. We need that. And if there's anything we can do as a leadership, I mean, we're always talking about what are ways we can do you know, yes, we talk about ways to reach a bunch of different groups, but the primary conversation we talk about on a regular basis is how do we get the That's black right. church more engaged in what we do? We would love, love uh, to be able to do that because really what we want to see is people restored to their families yes. more than anything, more mm -hmm. than getting them in a house, yes. more than getting them clean and sober. We want to see people restored to their families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To the white church, I would say, show up, do the thing, and keep your mouth shut and learn. You know, I, I feel like a lot of white folks, when they show up, they feel like they have a lot to offer and they're just gonna pour a little bit of their service or their money on different things. And, and there's some truth in that, but God wants you to bring an empty cup because there's so much richness that can come into your life by learning how to love someone and how to build a relationship with someone um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Volunteers show up here and feel like, you know, they've got so much to offer until like the third time. And then they come in and say, I really have nothing I can offer these folks. Uh, and I feel like I'm cheating because I get so much more out of this that I'm giving. Mm -hmm. But that's really just a part of being the hands and feet of Christ. That's yeah. part of being, loving your neighbor as yourself, mm -hmm. right? And so it's a joy to be here with you and it's a joy to work with you guys. So thank you for what you do. I appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate you.